I'm Dave Pressey, Flight Instructor and Fast Team Lead Rep. Welcome to the Maneuvering Approaches and Landings presentation. Throughout this program, you'll notice a special emphasis on risk management, which is a critical component of every aspect of flying, especially the maneuvers we'll be discussing today. The program consists of three segments, with an opportunity for group discussion between each. We hope you enjoy the presentation. Welcome to the Approaches and Landings presentation. We'll discuss ways you can avoid accidents during approach, maneuvering, and landing. Why the focus on approaches and landings? According to the latest edition of the NAL report, pilots continued the trend of more accidents during landings than in any other phase of flight. This graph shows a comparison between different levels of certification concerning the landing accident rate for 2008. Breaking down the numbers from a span of several years, this diagram shows that of the 15% average of flight time spent in these three phases of flight, 24% of all accidents are during landing, and overall, 47% of all accidents occur during the combined phases of maneuvering, approach, and landing. Year after year, pilot error continues to be the primary factor. Three out of four accidents can be directly attributed to human error. Pilot errors aren't intentional. Before we talk expressly about maneuvering, approach, and landing accidents, let's discuss why pilots make the errors leading to accidents and how you can avoid the pitfalls made by other pilots. The secret is limiting your exposure to risk. Pilot error as the major contributor to approach, maneuvering, and landing accidents is an established trend. Let's take a moment to talk about risk. Risk is defined as the future uncertainty created by a hazard. Depending on a person's skill set, the same situation will yield varied levels of risks. Total risk is the sum of identified and unidentified risks. Identified risk is the risk that has been determined through various analysis techniques. Unidentified risk is the risk that has not yet been identified. Some unidentified risks are subsequently identified when a mishap occurs, and still some risk is never known. Unacceptable risk is the risk that cannot be tolerated by the managing activity. It is a subset of the identified risk that must be controlled or eliminated. Acceptable risk is the part of identified risk that is allowed to persist without further action. Residual risk is the sum of acceptable risk and unidentified risks. This is the total risk passed on to the user, meaning you and me. How can you reduce your exposure to risk while flying? Let's examine the concept of increasing margins in our flying and decision making. We find margins in various places in our everyday life. In publishing, margins keep the print away from the page edges to allow us to focus on the text. On highways and roads, margins are called shoulders. Shoulders are the safety boundaries of the road. Stopping on the shoulder adds risk to the driver's day. His presence in the margin also adds a hazard for other drivers moving past. What's it like with slim or no margins? Riskier for sure. This is not a place for a new driver. Even for experienced drivers, this is not the time for a van full of distractions like kids and dogs, a check engine light, and oh by the way, when were those brake pads last replaced? This driver has no margin for error, no margin of safety. Hopefully he or she had a good night's sleep too. When we fly, there is a margin of safety that separates the demands of the task at hand and our piloting capabilities. The demands of task curving line shows the cumulative workload in any given point during the flight. All of the different flight-oriented duties require varying levels of skill and knowledge. Takeoffs are more demanding than cruise flight. Approaches are more demanding if the weather is down. The pilot's capabilities line will drop depending on the experience level, training, currency of the airman, fatigue, stress, or weather, irritable passengers, etc. In this example, we're showing the demands of task using 85% of the pilot's capabilities. As time goes on, factors such as fatigue set in, while factors such as weather may change for better or worse as the flight moves along. Let's say this is an ordinary three-hour flight, but the pilot didn't rest well the night before. He tires quickly due to rough weather, irritable passengers, and a mentally draining flight plan. His decisions become tainted because he just wants it to be over. He wants to be on the ground. He has allowed himself to get behind the plane 
that is, behind the demands of the present. His pilot capabilities have fallen below the demands of the task. These situations are all too common, and occasionally they lead to accidents and fatalities. We've seen how a pilot's capabilities can be lowered to shrink his or her margin of safety. Now let's look at how the demands of the task, or task load if you will, further shrink the margin of safety. A pilot's capabilities may be overwhelmed by the demands of the task. This too decreases his or her margin of safety. Let's use the example of a non-instrument rated private pilot embarking on a trip he believes will remain VFR all the way to his destination. He's neglected to check the weather, and it turns out that the early morning fog at his destination has now lifted to a low overcast. It's clear at the departure airport, so he launches on his trip. As he nears his destination, the clouds and visibility continue to drop until eventually he's experiencing conditions below the basic VFR values of 1,000 foot ceilings and 3 miles visibility. Remember, he can only do a visual approach. The demands of this task are squeezing out his margin of safety, yet he elects to continue the flight into deteriorating conditions, causing the task load or demands of task to exceed his capabilities. Will he make it or not? He might get lucky and maintain ground contact to the airport, but chances are he'll become disoriented and lose control before finding his destination. Game over. The task saturation theorem concludes that low pilot capabilities due to poor training or non-currency, along with a high task load, lead to an overwhelming level of task saturation and a reduced or absolutely no margin of safety. Task saturation bulging above the pilot's capabilities can occur at other times during the flight. Remember the discussion of margins earlier? Remember the picture of the bus driving on the mountain road? What kind of risks are associated with that? What are the identified and unidentified risks? Do you think that the driver could be taking identified and acceptable risks that the passengers are unaware of? Do you think that the driver is taking some acceptable risks that the passengers might find unacceptable? How do you decide whether a risk is acceptable or not? Begin by quantifying the risks. A risk that might not be acceptable to you might be perfectly acceptable to someone else. Different individual elements come into play when determining the acceptability of a risk. The primary elements are education, predisposition, attitude, training, and background. These vary from person to person. These five elements, background, education, training, attitude, and predisposition, combine to determine a pilot's propensity for being involved in an accident. An extensive study conducted by the FAA determined the similarities of two groups of pilots, those who have had clean accident and enforcement records, and those who have had accidents. Of the pilots prone to have accidents, the findings included these five traits. First, there was a disdain toward rules. This is not just regulations, but the laws of physics as well. Second, there was a high correlation between the accidents in their flying records and safety violations in their driving records. Third, these pilots fell into a personality category of thrill and adventure seeking. Fourth, when it came to information gathering, this group of pilots was impulsive rather than disciplined and methodical in the speed and selection of their actions. Last, this group showed an underuse or total disregard for help from others such as flight instructors, air traffic controllers, co-pilots, dispatchers, flight attendants, or other professionals they came in contact with. These accident-prone pilots tend to isolate themselves from important sources of information. When given relevant information, they routinely disregard it for the opinions and decisions they have already formed. Their feelings toward using a checklist during a flight is an example of this rebellious attitude. It has been determined that many accidents could have been avoided with proper use of checklists. Checklists are developed to circumvent the potential for human error. However, for many reasons, some pilots do not use them. One way to quantify our risk is to use the risk assessment matrix. Along the top of the matrix is the severity level of the worst possible outcome of an event. For example, landing in a crosswind. If that goes wrong, 
The results could be severe injury or death. That's catastrophic. On the other hand, having a door pop open in flight might only be marginally dangerous in terms of severity. On the left side of the matrix, we can rank the task in terms of the likelihood that the worst possible outcome will actually happen. The likelihood of an incident or accident will have a lot to do with the pilot's proficiency and his level of training. A well-trained, proficient commercial pilot is less likely to have a crosswind landing mishap than a newly certificated private pilot. As for a door popping open in flight, the risk should be about the same for either pilot, assuming they have both been trained to react properly to the event. In this example, we can see the correlation between the two charts. The pilot is a newly certificated private pilot. The flight is a three-hour flight ending after dark at an airport in the mountains of southwest Virginia. Newly certificated airmen have little night experience on average and perhaps no mountain experience. Worst possible outcome? Catastrophic. Likelihood? Certainly it's not remote or improbable. That puts the pilot in the high risk box. As task load exceeds pilot capabilities, the likelihood of a crash in mountainous terrain goes up. A private pilot who flies 10 hours a month will assess risks differently than the ATP with oodles of experience. For example, a private pilot flying on a morning with calm winds and no clouds has a wide margin of safety. He may consider the task of landing in calm winds at the destination as a safe maneuver. A landing accident under these conditions is remote, however, it could still be a catastrophic event if it occurred. Catastrophic severity, even when it's remote, puts the flight in a serious category. Let's return one more time to the margins discussion earlier. One tried and true best practice is establishing personal minimums for yourself. Personal minimums are an agreement with yourself that there are certain things you won't do, certain risks you won't take. You may have the nerve to drive this cliff road during the day, but would you do it at night? I don't see any streetlights. There, you just established a personal minimum for yourself. In aviation, it may be that you decide never to go into a mountainous airport via far at night. If you're instrument rated, you may be fine going there, but only using the full published instrument approach. You have to stop and think that what you don't see can hurt you and your passengers. We'll talk more about establishing personal minimums for different flight regimes in the next hour.